What about on the other side of things, the series that you think could go seven games? You've you've put the Thunder series as I one Thunder, Thunder Pelicans. Is that the most likely for no, you? No, I think the Sixers Knicks is the most likely. Mm-hmm. I think when we go back to Philly, I would not be surprised if the Knicks go back to Philly two zero up two zero. Um, but I could very much see Philly winning both their games at home and holding serve. Like first one to win on the road gets the advantage, and these two teams look very very evenly matched, even though they go on these runs. I think if I'm looking at if I'm if I were to like if I were to rank them, I would go Knicks Sixers one because I mean just as, as yeah. long again as long as Embiid and Maxi stay healthy right because that changes every dynamic. So you go through this assuming that you're going to have everybody out there. Pelicans Thunder would probably be two. I kind of still look at Mavs Clippers as a series that could go maybe the distance too. I agree. I think there's a real chance that that happens. We don't know what's going on with Kawhi. It's going to be a game by game thing and it always is. And I'll be honest with you. It's like, I feel bad because you know, he, he look, the dude wants to get out there and play it. But at the same time, this is every year. I mean, this is every year in the playoffs. The Clippers have had one, one opportunity with him out there and they went to a Western conference finals and every other year he's missed time. He was on an absolute tear in the first round last year and then got hurt again. And really, if you look across the NBA playoffs, it's another season. We got a lot of stars that are hurt once again right now heading into the playoffs. Giannis is out. Kawhi's out. Jimmy Butler's out. I mean, Joel Embiid just came back, but he's still kind of hobbled. Like, he's not 100%. We're watching. He's not 100%. He's no. he's gimping around out there. And Edwards was held to, like, 14 points per game against the Suns. Uh, Rudy Gobert was, like, a minus 25 when he was on the court. And everything flipped. Uh, once they got into the playoffs, um, we saw Ant Edwards arrive, and the Phoenix Suns' offense came to a screeching halt. Yeah, I thought he was extremely aggressive, but in a controlled way. I thought there were times in the regular season where he would, instead of accepting the double teams, it would be, I'm going to try to beat these double teams, and they resulted in turnovers or him taking four shots, and, and it was just kind of a real mess. So, I, I think that was a interesting kind of look at at uh, things for uh, him uh, going forward because what he was able to do in game one was I'm going to attack before the double can get there. And when the double comes, I'm going to get off the ball, but then I'm going to recycle very quickly to get the ball back. And asking for a double then followed by another double, that's just a hard thing for a defense to execute. And the Suns, let's face it, they're not a great defensive team. They get by on scheme more than talent. And there's only so much Frank Vogel can do. So I thought he played great. I thought Rudy Gobert did a really nice job, especially when he took uh, his turn against Kevin Durant. I thought Carl Anthony Towns, I wrote before the series started, he he has to give as good as he gets in this series, meaning if he's going to give up 20 points because of mismatches, he needs to go out and score 20. He was pretty close to even with that. And then Nikhil Alexander Walker was the guy who stepped up off the bench for, he was the best player off the bench for either team. It gave them a bunch of energy, some really, really good defense against Booker and Beal. And that, that was huge too. So I think Minnesota, I think they heard everybody saying Phoenix has their number. Phoenix is going to beat them. And they came out very focused and ready to go. It sounds to me like you're not overly concerned about the size then, because that is something, listen, we all know you can pack on pounds. You work with trainers, you eat a lot, and you'll still be able to keep your mobility and those types of things. He's going to work with the best trainers. Does that worry you as much as it seems to worry some other people, or is it maybe more of the not worried about the size but are worried about the, the hits that he's taken? I mean, listen, nobody's the perfect prospect. Even Caleb Williams, who's the consensus number one, people worry about his ability to play within a system, right? Um, I think Daniel's the biggest concerns are kind of the, the, the frame, just that he's kind of wiry versus big. Um, and, and, you know, the analytical community will tell you that the pressure to sack stuff is problematic. But I, I think everybody – I mean, Drake May, like, if you're just considering Daniels versus May and your concern with Daniels is, oh, man, he could get hit really hard and, and, and have an impact on his career – well, one, that's true for every quarterback. And I kind of think it's more true for pocket guys that can get blasted if they don't have that elusiveness. I think for May, your concern is that his footwork's sloppy and he misses the easy stuff. And he might – everybody's talking about his potential and his upside, and it's there and it's real. But, like, to me, those are much bigger question marks than Daniels might be too skinny. 
What do you think about some of the steam on J.J. McCarthy being ahead of Drake May on somebody else's draft board? Is that shocking to you? Is that just kind of part of the lying season? Or is there anything to this this growing uh, enamor or allure with a guy who I think threw less than, I don't know, you know, what we saw with Jimmy Garoppolo in San Francisco? Right. I mean, their second biggest win of the regular season was at Penn State where they didn't let him throw a pass the whole second half. <laughs> right? Like, so yes. it's fair to have some JJ questions. Um, I do kind of see it, though, and I think it's about McCarthy, the prospect, where, I mean, he's a five star coming out of California. That kid could have gone anywhere he wanted. He wanted to play for Harbaugh and play in that, like, win first style and not necessarily, like, the offensive system of choice kind of thing. Um, and, and I think I think with Drake, there are some people that see the upside and are enamored by it. But I think with Drake, there's some people that are like, yo, are we sure about this guy? Like, he, he, he doesn't keep his feet in a clean pocket. So I, I, think, I think the Drake evaluations are a little more split and the JJ evaluations are, are, are closer to uniform that I think the, the comp you hear a lot for J.J. McCarthy is Alex Smith. And Alex Smith wasn't exciting and, you know, certainly never won a Super Bowl or anything, but he did win a lot of regular season games. And I think there's a fair amount of the NFL that looks at that and is like, man, that'll keep me employed. You know, uh, Drake May is the kind of boomer bust guy. But all that said, I got a text today from uh, a buddy of mine in the league that literally just said, I don't understand what any of this is about with McCarthy. So there are some, <laughs> some folks that are split there, too. Patriots are also reportedly entertaining offers as well to move back. Uh, what do you think their plan is for the draft if they were to move the third pick? And do you think there's value for them at three, taking, say, a, a Marvin Harrison Jr.? Or, or should they either keep the pick and go quarterback or move back? It's a great question. Um, their roster is just not very good right now. And you can easily make the case, I feel like, uh, moving back and getting more assets for the future. But if you, if you fall in love with Harrison or, or May, like you think, you think Drake May is going to be the best quarterback in this draft, you take him at three, right? You deal with building your roster up over the years. If you think that he, you know, you have some questions. I don't know if he's going to be that guy. I'm not quite sure. Then, then, then don't take him. If you think Harrison's going to be, that much of a difference maker moving forward for a quarterback you might draft in the second round, a quarterback next year, you take Harrison. I would trade back if I could. I, guys, I think trading back is never the wrong idea, especially if you're a team that needs uh, to just have a better roster. I mean, how many times is, is that really in the end hurt someone? And you get another first for next year most likely, and you have ammo to go get a quarterback next year. I mean, to me, I think trading back is always the answer. And if New England gets that opportunity, I think they will.